Good morning. What? That's right. I know. I know. First Kings nine. This passage, probably more than any other passage, of course, it continues on in chapter ten as well, describes exactly what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes two. We said, I denied myself nothing. It lists everything here. And so uh, Solomon did this, and Solomon did this, and Solomon collected that. And this goes on and on for a couple chapters, all the stuff that he uh, collected, all the stuff that uh, uh, he acquired and controlled. So we pick it up here, chapter 9, verse 20, 1 Kings All the people who were left are the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who are now the children of Israel, that is, their descendants, who were left in the land after them, whom the children of Israel had not been able to destroy completely. From these, Solomon's raised up forced labor, as it is to this day. But of the children of Israel, Solomon made no forced laborers, because they were men of war, and his servants, and his officers, and his captains, and the commanders of his chariots, and his uh, cavalry. Others were chiefs of the officials who were over Solomon's work. Uh, 550 who ruled over the people who did the work. But Pharaoh's daughter came up from the city of David to her house, which Solomon had built for her. Then he built the Milo. Now three times a year, Solomon offered uh, burnt uh, offerings and peace offerings on the altar which he had built for the Lord, and he burnt incense with them on the altar that was before the Lord. So he finished the uh, temple. King Solomon also built a fleet of ships at Ezion Geber, which is near Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. Then Hiram sent his uh, servants with the fleet to seamen who knew the sea to work with the servants of Solomon. And they went to Ophir and acquired 420 talents of gold from there and brought it to King Solomon. The first thing I want you to notice in this passage we just read, the the name Solomon's mentioned eight times in nine verses. (laughs) It was Solomon's men and Solomon's servants and Solomon's gold and Solomon's you know, buildings and so- Solomon, 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 his slaves and his men and his officers. Solomon continued to build grander things and collect greater things. And Solomon marshaled the entire nation to work for him. And notice he said forced labor. Well, forced labor is what? <laughs> Enslavement, right? (laughs) They were slaves. So he took the remnant of the Canaanites, uh, all this mixed people, the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Amorites, and he forced them to be laborers. Now, they're going to be the grunt work. They're going to be carrying the stones for the buildings. They're going to be doing all the heavy labor. So he enslaved them, and then he made servants for himself, uh, the soldiers and builders and overseers of the Peter people and projects and staff administration, all these for Solomon. He even built a merchant fleet at Eloth, which is in the extreme south of the, of the country on the Gulf of Aqaba, which is, of course is part of the Red Sea, to transport gold and goods for him. Right, for Solomon, um, which is kind, kind of interesting because Israel was not a uh, seafaring nation, uh, but he built that fleet just to carry his what? <laughs> just to carry his gold, you know? And so notice Solomon concentrates on his projects over and over. We have mentioned here, we're going to see it all in the next chapter as well. It's his servants and his people, and he built it for him and Solomon's work. All these things are listed here. Solomon. 
Now, when Solomon had finished his wife's house in the northern part of the country, uh, she moved up there from the city of David. Now, city of David, when you see that, that was, that was David's palace, right? That was his old palace. Wasn't good enough for Solomon. Solomon had to build a bigger one and a better one and everything else. Now, I was curious, as soon as her house was built, she left Jerusalem, went up there. I wonder if that said something about her, her relationship with Solomon. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, build her house. Um, treats Pharaoh's daughter nice because she's a daughter of Pharaoh. You better, you know. I mean, Pharaoh's one guy you want to be on his good side, right? So, so you want to do that. And so it was built there. She takes off. She moves up from the old palace to the house that he built her in the country. And then Solomon worked on his own palace. Remember, we were told that Solomon took 13 years to build his house, which it contrasts to seven years to build the temple. So it takes 13 years to build his palace. Uh, Solomon then uh, finished that. Then Solomon would go down to the temple uh, during the three major feasts. You have three major feasts during the year with its offerings, right? You have the Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And so three times a year you go up and make an offering. Now I'm going to presume, okay, that he does it according to Leviticus. The priests are actually making the offering. He's presenting the offering. He's not the one actually doing the sacrificing. And uh, so he did this. Now, my question is, and I don't have an answer for this, was he making the offering because it's required, or was he really worshiping the Lord? Was he making the offering as a public display, you know, because look at this great temple and I'm going to utilize it? Because it doesn't seem his actions follow that he's really like David, a man after God's own heart. It doesn't seem that way to Solomon, because if you notice, everything's about Solomon, Solomon, Solomon. To so say his name is mentioned eight times in these nine verses. Solomon's works and Solomon's, you know, uh, Solomon's gold and Solomon's, uh, you know, military. So was he focused on God, or was it because, okay, I'm going to make a grand display of making a sacrifice in the temple and leading the people to sacrifice? Because that's exactly what we saw with the dedication of the temple. Solomon led in the sacrifice. He brought it in. Solomon was always center stage. Now, for a second time, he mentions he built the Milo. Uh, last week, I said Milo was a landfill. It actually means fullness. And actually what, the, what Milo is was he made a fortification. He used the landfill type from his building projects to make a fortification in Shechem is what he did. So this is a major fort. This is a major post. Shechem is a very strategic location because it's halfway up to Jordan. So it's at a very key location. So he takes the landfill, takes all the dirt instead of piling it up over here, you know, uh, across from Joint Base Andrews, you see that big hill. He, he, he made a fortification out of it, so it double work. So he, so he built that. Apparently, it was a major fortification there. And Solomon uh, built this, had a major military post, and Solomon's merchant fleet was to carry his gold. That's the only reason he built the fleet. Uh, God had brought, the gold was brought from Ophir. Now, where, where's Ophir? Ophir is in the southern part of Saudi Arabia, around Yemen or Oman. Uh, they believe that's where the Queen of Sheba came from, that area, because she brought gifts of gold to them. Uh, so this, this is the area that it came from. And so to bring it up, the best way to do that was to ship it rather than try to bring it up through the desert, <laughs> Saudi Arabian desert. So he went down there. Uh, so he has these ships. Now, Hiram, he was a generous one here. <laughs> it was Hiram, right? Hiram sends down some of his Navy guys, <laughs> his seamen. They were known as the Sea People. Tyre is the capital of Phoenicia. 
Uh, we get our alphabet from it, right? Phonetics, Phoenicia. They pretty well controlled the trade in the whole Mediterranean Sea. Remember, it was a Syrophoenician ship that Jonah was on, okay? They established the cities of Syracuse in Sicily, of Carthage. They established the cities of, uh, of, of Tarshish. So he's going to Tarshish. That was, well, that was theirs. And I just read yesterday. I did not know this. I was reading. This is kind of interesting. Maybe it was to me. I was reading about the great earthquake of uh, 1455 in, Port, in, in Lisbon that destroyed the city, and said it was established by Phoenicia too. Isn't that interesting? Because that's all the way around, all the way around Spain, through the, the Strait of Gibraltar, all the way up the coast. So, boy, their tradesmen went all over the place. And so they established these cities. And what were these cities? These were trading posts. Matter of fact, the king of Tyre at the time was probably the richest man on the planet even richer than Pharaoh. Matter of fact, he's so rich that if you read Ezekiel chapter 28, it compares Lucifer with who? The king of Tyre. Because <laughs> remember, what does it say about Lucifer there in Ezekiel 28? He says, you know, because of his beauty, because of the richness, that he was clothed with precious stones and diamonds and everything else. And it compares it to the king of Tyre. Tyre was not a great military force, although it was a great navy force. It was a great commercial force. And so Hiram says, listen, you guys don't have really many navy guys, <laughs> merchant guys. Even today, Israel only has one natural port. And the Old Testament is called Jaffa, the New Testament is called Joppa, and it's near the city of Haifa today. And, and we, were, we were there. That's the only natural port that it had. Now, the Romans tried to build a port at Caesarea in the northern part, uh, a dredged port, but the sea kept doing what? It kept claiming it back, <laughs> you know. It kept burning the silt. They dredged it, and then they would come in, and the silt would build up, and they'd dredge it. They finally gave up. There's no port up in Caesarea today. They only had one natural port. They weren't, Israel was not a sea-going people. Uh, Phoenicians had a navy, but, but up there with Tyre and Sidon, they were seagoing people. And so Hiram, I mean, this guy, if you would take a look at these two men side to side, and which one do you think was the one more biblical in his attitude? It's surely Hiram, right, versus Solomon. And he says, I tell you what, you guys really don't know what you're doing out there on the sea. I mean, this is... We're going to, I'm going to send you some guys who really know how to work a boat and how to build a ship and, and how to navigate. And so, so he goes down and he sends them. And uh, I have a misprint in your outline here. Uh, it's not 820000 820 million dollars worth of gold. That's what, uh, uh, you know, 420 talents of gold would be worth today. So Solomon brought... And it was all given to who? It was all, he said it was all given to Solomon. <laughs> you know, I mean, this looks like the old Rockefeller statement, right? Well, how much is enough? He said, just a little bit more. <laughs> how much is enough, right? Just a little bit more. And so $820 million worth of gold he brings in. Now, I, I find it very intriguing that it doesn't mention he carried anything else, although in the next chapter it said he also brought in apes. I don't know where he kept them. He also brought in exotic animals to keep, so apparently he had a zoo or something, you know, and uh, he collected things and <clears throat> all for himself. Now, this is the glory of Solomon's kingdom, and I think this is a point. This is a point I think the Lord's trying to make here, and to me, it's a very important point that the, most of the planet throughout history has missed. God allowed Solomon to have anything he wanted to. Remember, he asked for wisdom. He says, I'm going to add all these other things to you, right? Any, anything you want. Well, he obviously wanted a lot of wives, right? <laughs> he wanted a lot of gold. He wanted great palaces. <clears throat> he had 9,000 horses. He had hundreds and hundreds of chariots. He had servants. 
He had anything, it, God says anything you want. Now, notice the contrast here. If you want wisdom to rule his people, I'm going to give you gold. You've got to choose which one. You're going to concentrate on, right? You're going to concentrate on the wisdom to be able to rule these people and to worship the Lord. You're going to concentrate on collecting things for yourself and your own glory. He had a choice, right? God, I'm going to let you choose. Whichever one it is. <clears throat> and so we know from Ecclesiastes how this turned out, right? And so here, so what Solomon did and stay and said, you know, doesn't say Solomon, you know, elevated the poor. It doesn't say Solomon went out and, uh, and, and helped uh, uh, the, the farmers or the villagers. It doesn't say any of that stuff. He says he collected things, he built things, he entertained himself. Uh, he used his citizens as servants. I want you to notice that phrase here. It says, and he made Israel all his what? Servants. You know, you're go either going to be a citizen or a subject. Now, the present day government in our country is trying to make us all subjects. <laughs> and so, um, so here he used them as resources to enhance, enhance who? Well, to enhance himself, right? So God demonstrated through Solomon the vanity of riches. Matthew chapter 6, which to me is a direct contrast to what we have here, purposely so, because Solomon is the standard of what? Yeah, sure, wealth and opulence, right? He said, I mean, you name it, he had it. You know, if he lived today, he'd have the biggest televisions, the biggest mansions, the biggest yachts, the big, you know, he had it. Jesus turned and says, see the lily of the field? Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. In other words, compared to God and his creation, this was nothing. As a matter of fact, you ever look on Google Maps and you see this marvelous sight? But when you pan out away from it, what does it do? It just disappears. I mean, compared to God's creation, and we think the Earth is a moderate-sized planet, right? Jupiter's eight times its size, right? Now, I forget, what was it, 820,000 Earths you can fit inside the sun? I mean, something like that, some ridiculous number. I mean... And then the sun is a moderate-sized, medium-sized star in a whole universe of enormous stars. Our galaxy with, you know, uh, however it is, 100 million stars or whatever it is, and there might be 100 million galaxies. <laughs> really? Solomon, you think you got glory? I mean, compared to God, whatever we collect is nothing. Absolutely not. So I think he allowed Solomon to do this. Okay, go for it. And you notice several things happen. First of all, glory fades, right? You know, one of the things, uh, one of the things that Proverbs 31 mentions is the fact beauty fades, you know. But someone who honors the Lord, you know, her honor will never fade. But beauty fades, it goes away. And Solomon used all these people to accomplish this. <clears throat> I always, when I read passages like this, I always ask myself, how much misery did Solomon create? Right? I'm so much so they rebelled against his son Rehoboam. How much misery to get his glory? The glory for one person. It's all about him. It's all about Solomon. And so Solomon, now I want you to notice some other things, that Solomon used the people to put gold, but notice everything Solomon says. It says, and these are the labors of my hand. Were they the labors of his hands? Do you think Solomon even put one stone in? You know, it's like a, a former president of ours who says, you didn't build that. Well, yeah, you took our taxpayers 
uh, our tax money, and you built the road stuff. Don't, don't give me none of that. And it says, the work of my hands. And by the way, one of the things I've been working on is it's still a few years away on this commentary on Ecclesiastes, is he even bemoans that he had to give up some of his money to pay people to do the work for him. He didn't want, he wanted to keep it all. <laughs> I mean, he did not have a generous spirit at all. Matter of fact, there's only one, and we, we looked at it last week, only one place in Scripture I see where he gave anything away, and there were 20 worthless villages. And he gives it to the guy who helped him the most, right? <laughs> I mean, this, 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 this is pretty sad. So Solomon considered all the labors of his hand. He did not acknowledge that God helped him. He didn't acknowledge that the people who were the one doing the work actually helped him. He didn't acknowledge that Hiram, who'd sent all these people down to help, helped him. Everything belonged to him. And one of the saddest passages in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 12, says, now I've got to give it all up. <laughs> you know, he mentions three things in Ecclesiastes 12, which I find intriguing. Number one, all the stuff that uh, he uh, collected and, and all the stuff, that, and all singers, everything, when he got old, he couldn't enjoy it. He said, I can't hear him. He says, matter of fact, I think, I, I love that uh, passage that says, I don't even know if there's singers singing or if there's a riot in the street. <laughs> Secondly, he couldn't taste his food. He says his eye gates were closing. He's walking on three legs. I know about that. <laughs> He's walking on three legs. The third thing he says, what, 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 what does he say? Boy, if he only said that at the beginning of his reign, please ask his 12, one, what, what's he say? He says, Remember thy creator in the what? Days of your youth. Boy, he should have done that one first, right? Remember thy creator in the days of your youth. And so here, <clears throat> so he considered everything that belonged to him, and much to Psalm's dismay, he had to leave it all behind. And he got to the point where even towards the end of his life, he couldn't enjoy any of it. He couldn't hear, he couldn't see, he could barely walk. And he says, I don't know if the per guy I leave it to is going to be wise or a fool. Now, the reason why I think God did this is show, he says, you want, you want glory and you want wealth, I'm going to let this man do that and see how it works out. <laughs> right? I've always said over the years, I says, after reading Ecclesiastes, no one has an excuse of chasing wealth as their prime goal, right? I mean, Solomon said, don't do it. This is what's going to happen to you. And every time, that's what happens to you. That's why Madonna said fame and fortune isn't what it's cracked up to be. You can't bring happiness. You know, uh, John Higgins wrote Where Eagles Dare, you know. Uh, you know, he said, one, you know, Nobel Prize winning author and everything else. He says, you know, if once I got to the top, if I knew I was there, I wouldn't have bothered. <laughs> you know, Deion Sanders, go, you know, goes back to his motel after winning the Super Bowl. He says, is that it? Right? Is this supposed to be the ultimate Achievement in life? Is that really? And supposedly that was instrumental for him coming to know Jesus Christ because he said it must be something else. That's Gary Paxton's testimony. Say, so who's Gary Paxton? Well, he has, I don't think it's in the Majesty Hymn Book, but it was in our old hymn book, you know. Uh, he was there all the time. That's his. You know, he said, you know, he was a rocker, strung out on drugs. Ended up in a gutter, and when he came to himself, he said, is that it? Is that all there is? Someone led him to the Lord. Now he calls himself a rocker for Christ. I don't know how that works out, but anyway, you know. Uh, he said, that's it. He said, you know, in the song, you read that, you know, he's chasing the rainbows in, and there was nothing there. 
And so he, he didn't acknowledge God, and God says, okay, you want, to, you want to know what it is to have absolute power, absolute wealth, here it is. See how that's going to work out for you. And the psalm said, this is useless. He was having a lot of fun for a while. Until it continues, that's one of the themes of the, of the, of the book I wrote, uh, you know, the, the most recent novel, something to cheer about, you know, is the, the, the hero of the story, you know, he ends up saying, this is it, this, is, this doesn't work. <laughs> that's the theme. The glory of God, pinnacle of man's glory, falls way short. I like what William Shatner said. He went up in Blue Orange, remember? That weird rocket that Bezos had. And when he went up, he said, wait a minute, the atmosphere, what, are we 50 miles up? He said, no, seven. And he looked down to earth and this little teeny thin band of atmosphere keeping us alive. And we got back to earth, he said, I gotta rethink this. Now you think a guy who'd been where no man's going before, you know. <laughs> but he says, you know, I'm looking at this earth, and what sustains us is this little band of atmosphere. And he was raised like all the public school kids that, you know, this all evolved and developed. So he says, no, I got to read. Now, I don't know if William Shatner, what, he's 90 or something? I don't know if he's going to come to know the Lord, but he said, i got to rethink this. This little miraculous planet with seven miles of breather, breatherable atmosphere wrapped around it. God's glory is so magnificent that no matter what man builds, it pales insignificant. That's one of the disappointments. Now, you guys, when you went on your trip, went to uh, Mount Rushmore, right? Every time you see Mount Rushmore, what do you see? The picture's up. This close-up of these, you know, four large heads, when you drive up to it, it's way up there. And it looks like it's, I said, wait a minute. You know, I thought it would be like the height of our ceiling here. You stand there looking at this thing. It's 500 feet up. And you go, wait a minute. That guy spent all those years doing this. And compared even to the mountain it's on, it's very, what? Incident. That's what man's is. And so God allowed Solomon to work without immediate correction. Say, listen, I'm going to let you have anything you want. And let's see how it turns out. And so he ends up in the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes saying it was all what? It's all vanity. It's all worthless. He says, if I'm going to give you my final advice, it's this. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. If I could do it all over again. By the way, if Solomon could do it all over again, he probably would have made the same mistakes. <laughs> Because it takes a heart change, doesn't it? Now, I don't know, you know, Steve's question last week, Solomon saved? I I'm assuming so. But his life surely didn't honor the Lord. And don't suspect he will have a lot of rewards. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for giving us wisdom by seeing how these... Uh, these propositions really work out if we're not following you, Lord. Lord, as we discuss these things, Lord, just may your name be glorified in all this, and may we be following you and not chasing an empty rainbow's end, which ends up in all vanity, Lord. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.